Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a slightly different setup to what I'm used to. I'm used to being able to see everyone's faces in front of me. So um, to help with the engagement, if you are confused or something I've said doesn't make sense, as Jana said, please do pop a question in the chat. And if I miss it, Jana will alert me to it. I'd like, you should all have um, this back on track printed workbook that's been handed out to you. And if you turn to the back of it, I think it's on the second last page, page 23. If you could please turn to this pre and post test, um, I would like to give you three or four minutes to see if you can answer these biological terms. The topic today is human reproduction, um, but we would very much like to see what you know before we start so that we can see how much you have improved by the end of the session. So I'm going to give you four minutes or so to please read through these biological terms and write down in the space provided what you think the answer is. For anyone who's just joined, it's Mrs. Taylor. We are doing the human reproduction chapter today for life sciences. And at the back of your learner packs, if you could please do this little pre-test by writing down the answer to these biological terms, you have about two minutes left. Hello, good morning. I see we've got one or two new um, schools that have joined us. It's Mrs. Taylor and today we are going to be going through the human reproduction chapter for life sciences. Um, just to remind you that this is less of a teaching you all of the content and more of a revision opportunity. So I want to spend most of my time going through 
past papers, questions, and kind of analyzing those questions with you to give you as many hints and tips as I possibly can. So I asked you if you could do this little pre-test for me. Um, really, it's an indication for you to see that you, to see what you know. And if you knew hardly any of it, that's fine. That's the point of today, so that we can get you to go from maybe one or two out of 12 to 12 out of 12. So we're going to redo this same test again at the end. Um, so let's go through the answers quickly. And I would like you to sort of make corrections, or sorry, not to make corrections for yourself. I just want you to put a little cross next to the ones you got wrong and a little tick next to the ones you got right. I'm not going to, um, to explain the answers to you now because we'll do that as we go through the content and then we'll see what you how you do at the end. So if you could please just check your answers to those questions or those biological terms and give yourself a tick next to the ones you already knew and a little cross next to the ones that you did not. To whoever it is that just joined us, I've just asked the learners to turn to the back of their books and do this little pre-test on the human reproduction chapter. And we're just looking through the answers on their own first. Right, so grade 12s, let's see how we can improve on that little score. So I'm going to go through a slideshow with you. I will tell you when you need to refer to your learner material that has been given to you um, when we get to the questions. By all means, as we're going through this, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, if you would like to just make a note of your little question on a piece of paper, and ask at the end in case something is not clear, then that's absolutely fine. And feel free to make any relevant notes for yourselves as we go. Right, so um, one of the first things that is important to note, if I can just get the slideshow to move. Second. No, it doesn't seem to want to allow me to change the slide in presenter mode. Um, let me know if this isn't big enough for you, but this seems to be the best that um, I'm going to I'm going to get this. Um, right, so we've already done that. While I'm here, it's important for me to remind you that the re human reproduction chapter in paper one is 41 marks of paper one. So it is a very large component of that exam. Um, that's almost a third of the paper. So not knowing human reproduction well is not an option. <laughs> um, and the way they've asked questions in these recent years is very detailed and specific. So it's important that you know the terminology and the exact details as well as you can. Right, let's go through some of the things that um, have kind of been issues for learners in the past. This is a good idea for the teachers to also perhaps pay attention to these so that when you revise with your learners before prelims, you can remind them of of these things. So I'm not going to go through everything in our diagnostic reports from the finals from, from the past years, but just some of the, the main sticking points. Um, 
So one of the problems in general is when learners read without understanding what the question is asking. So reading with meaning is an important skill to practice. So doing as many past questions as possible does help with that. Right, then it said that learners may tend to focus on a word in a question that is easily recognizable and then attempt to provide a response that doesn't fit the context of the question. So, for so example, Taylor, yes, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think the screen might be a little too small for some of the colleagues to see. So I just want to check um, if there's any way. Let's see if this could. OK, and if you. There it is. It's much bigger now. I just hope that you can move yes, it between seems your to be, slides. There yeah, it seems to okay, be a bit better now. Okay, right, thank I'm you. Sure that will make a difference. Thanks. Thanks, Yana. Um, so, for example, if we give you a diagram of a sperm cell, for example, and the beginning of the question says describe, then sometimes learners will almost make up what they think the question is asking just by looking at the diagram, but without actually reading the context of the question carefully. So it's important to always read the beginning stem of the question very clearly. And I'll go through some examples with you just now. Um, and then the last little point here says, learners might tend to repeat or paraphrase questions or scenarios in their responses, while some attempt to repeat answers from previous questions. So it's important to not just copy down what the question is asking. You need to make sure that you're actually answering the question itself. So identifying what it's asking is important. Okay, and then I'm not sure why on my side the coloring is not great, but it's just um, highlighting a recommendation for you, um, which is to underline the keyword in a question. So I'll do some of these with you just now, but identifying the command of the question, which we call the stem of the question. So is it define? Is it name or state? Is the question asking you to explain or analyze? And I'll go through what some of those mean with you. Okay, right, so if we just want to revise a little bit of the human reproduction section so long, I hope you can see my cursor. I've tried to make it a little bit bigger for you. So we are going to be looking at the female reproductive organs and then the process of making gametes, so sex cells through gametogenesis, and then looking at the hormonal changes that happen in especially the female, and then fertilization and implantation so that the whole human life cycle can continue again. Oh, that is quite small. Um, I'm just wondering if I can try and make that a little bigger. Sorry, don't know what happened there. I don't think it was so small when I did this. <laughs> Apologies. Okay, so as I mentioned, oopsie, sorry. As I mentioned just now, the um, terminology and being very specific with your words is very important in life science and especially in Paper one, there are many biological terms across more than one chapter that often get confused. So these are some of the most common mistakes that learners make. Um, and they use these terms incorrectly or in the wrong place. And although they might sound very similar, they often have very different meanings. And so then we cannot award the mark for incorrect spelling. Um, there are cases where if the word is spelt incorrectly, but if we said it out loud, it still sounded like the correct word, then we can give you the mark. But if it means something completely different, then we can't. So please look out for these. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but chorion, this is one of the extra embryonic membranes in the human reproduction chapter versus a choroid, which is one of the layers in the eye. 
These words, um, uterus, ureta, and urethra, are often spelt incorrectly, and then it changes the meaning. The uterus is where the fetus develops. The ureta, we don't really cover in grade 12, but that's the little tube that takes urine from the kidney to the bladder. And the urethra is where urine and semen leave the, leave the male. Right, then sperm and semen, I'm going to spend a minute just going through this um, one over here. Sperm refers to the sperm cells. So those are the cells themselves that are going to be swimming inside the semen. So the semen is the fluid. Sorry. The semen is the fluid and the sperm cells are the cells that are swimming in the semen. So you need to make sure you differentiate between those. I'll come back to that later. Epidermis, that's your skin, and epididymis is one of the tubules in the male reproductive system. Right, this one, um, lots of learners use the word egg instead of ovum. The correct biological term for an, a female egg cell is an ovum. If you said egg cell, then sometimes they can accept that, but not just egg on its own. Okay, otherwise we might think you're talking about an egg that you would eat for breakfast. Right, then um, uterine wall versus uterine lining. Okay, this one they are very strict about. The uterine wall refers to the muscle of the uterus. And the uterine lining is not detailed enough. Um, you would need to tell us which lining. There are many linings in the, in the uterus. So you would need to say the inner lining of the uterus, which is technically called the endometrium. So that is the term that they would prefer is endometrium. Right, then corpus callosum versus corpus luteum. This is also a very common error because corpus is in both. But corpus callosum is in the brain and corpus luteum is what the graphene follicle becomes in the ovary. Right, then this one over here, um, I understand the error that is often made. Learners refer to the amnion when they mean the amniotic fluid. But the amnion is the membrane that surrounds the developing fetus or developing baby um, and produces amniotic fluid. So you just need to be clear on which one you're talking about. And then this one, um, a question like this came up in the pre-test that I went through or that I asked you to do. But it is important that you know the difference between these. And I'm going to highlight this for you with a diagram just now. So I'm going to stop with that one. Okay, then I'm going to just go through these a bit quicker because I am aware of the fact that we only have a certain amount of time. Right, section A. Section A is often thought to be the easy part of your exam because it's all the shorter questions, but it is not always easier. And if you think your exam is 150 marks and 150 minutes, so if you plan to use your time for a mark a minute, then you have a decent amount of time to do section A, so don't rush it. Um, with multiple choice, one of the things that's important for you to know is that you may only give one letter as your answer. So if you're reading through the question and you think, mm, I think the answer could be B or C, and you write both of them, then it will not be marked. Even if the letter you wrote first is correct, they will ignore it and it will be wrong. You must only choose one letter. Then with biological terms, you may not use any abbreviations. So, for example, if you needed to write, if the answer is follicle stimulating hormone, you may not write FSH in the biological term section of your paper. In section B, FSH is fine, but not in this part of section A. Okay, no abbreviations. Um, then the third one is really just a tip to say that when you are studying, at some point in your studying, you should practice writing out these very important biological terms for each section, because the more you write them, the more you will get used to writing and spelling them correctly. Um, and that last one, again, is about understanding what the question is asking you. 
Right, so let's get into some of the content. Just want to keep an eye on my an eye on the time there. Okay. Right, so we're going to start with the male reproductive system. And like I said to you earlier, my focus today is revision and exposing you to questions and how you need to approach answering questions and less on teaching. So I'm going to go through things quite quickly because you should have been taught this content already. But if something is unclear and you would like me to re-explain it, then please let us know in the chat. Right, so it is very commonly asked that you will be given um, the male reproductive system to, to know and to go through. I'm going to highlight something just now in the um, in the exam guidelines for you. I'll show you something there. But while I am going through this, with all these kinds of diagrams in the human reproduction chapter, but actually in any life sciences chapter, if you can label the diagram, so if you get yourself a picture of the diagram and you can label what it is and what it does, then that's half the battle won. Okay, so let's start over here at the bottom. Right, so here we've got the testes, um, one testis and two testes. In this, in this diagram, we only see one of them. And the job of the testes is to produce the sperm cells. So not semen. Remember the difference between sperm and semen? This is making the sperm cells that are carrying the male genetic material. Okay. They are also responsible for producing the male hormone, which is testosterone. So the testes have both of those functions. Right. Then the testes are held in this thin um, piece of skin, really, called the scrotum. Be careful not to use um, kind of everyday language words for the scrotum. So um, we often get learners that write words like ball sack. But unfortunately, although that might be what you call it in everyday kind of context, we can only give marks for biological terms. Right. So the scrotum's job um, is to hold the testes outside of the body. Right. If you remember back to your other grades, the body's core temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius and sperm cells, which need to be made in the testes, optimally are produced at two to three degrees lower than than core body temperature. So you want something to regulate the temperature of the testes. So when it's hot, they can hold the testes slightly further away from the body to keep it cool. And if it's cold, then they can hold the testes slightly closer to the body. So there are often questions that imply your understanding of this concept. So I will give you an example of one now. Um, a few years ago, they asked why it is not good for men to wear pants that are too tight okay so now you need to think if it's too if pants are too tight then the scrotum is unable to move the testes further away from the body so they're unable to regulate the temperature so you need to think biologically what does that question have to do with that part of the body that i studied and it's lending itself to this explanation here. Okay, so then once the sperm cells are produced, they move into this part here at the top of the testes. We have what we call the epididymis, right? Be careful to spell it epididymis and not epidermis. Right, though that is where the sperm cells are temporarily held and stored. Okay, they're not protected there. They are not, well, they are protected because they're inside the body, but then um, don't give other possible descriptions for what the epididymis does. Its job is to mature the sperm cells, right, and temporarily store them. Right, and then the sperm cells move through this tube over here, which is called the vas deferens. In this diagram here, it's labeled as the sperm duct. But the correct biological term is vas deferens, but you may use either term. So you may use vas deferens or sperm duct. And the 
sperm are transported through this sperm duct until it reaches the beginning part of this tube over here, which is the urethra. Now, the urethra's job is to allow semen and urine to exit through the penis. If they ask you, what is the reproductive function of the urethra, then you leave the urine part out of your answer. Then they're only asking about reproductive function. Then it's only to transport semen out of the body. But if they just ask for the function in general, then you may include urine. Okay, just a little note here. Be careful that you don't say to transport sperm cells. Sperm cells were made in the testes, but by the time they move through the sperm duct and they get to the base of the urethra, then the fluids that make up the semen have been added. So it's semen that moves through the urethra, not sperm cells alone. Right, now these three glands, you've got the prostate gland over here, which is the largest of the three um, accessory glands. And then you've got the seminal vesicle, which almost looks like a leaf shape. And then you've got the little cowper's gland right underneath the prostate in a diagram, at least. That's where we see it. Um, and those three glands produce the seminal fluids. Now, on this diagram, it tells you what the different glands produce. However, we do not require you to know which gland produces which fluid. It is much more important that you just know what the job of those fluids is. So it doesn't matter that the prostate gland produces the fluid um, for alkalinity, to make the fluid alkaline. It doesn't matter because all those fluids add together. The prostate gland, the seminal vesicle, and the corpus gland, they all join. So this is much more important. We want to know, what are the properties of the semen? So, it, for example, it's alkaline. And what does that do? Right, so knowing what the adaptations and uses of the seminal fluid is, is important. Okay, so alkaline means that it neutralizes the acidity of the vagina so that the sperm cells can live so it's protecting the sperm cells then the fluid also adds nutrients which is going to give the sperm cells some energy so that they can swim and then it also contains mucus which allows the sperm cells to swim easily or to move easily through the um, in the semen in order to swim through the uterus right then I'm not going to spend very long on this diagram, but it is an important one for you to know. Okay, so you have to be able to label a sperm cell. So head, midsection, and tail. And then for each of these parts, you need to know what they do. So head contains the nucleus, which has got the haploid number of gametes, or the 23 chromosomes of the male. And then at the very top, some diagrams have another little section here. They draw another little circle here. If it's at the very end, it's the acrosome. Try not to confuse the acrosome and the nucleus. So the acrosome is right at the tip, and then the nucleus is a little bit more central to uh, the head of the sperm cell. And the acrosome's function is important. It contains enzymes, which is a kind of protein. And the job of that enzyme is to digest the wall of the ovum so that this nucleus may penetrate and fertilize the egg cell. Right, be careful, don't say egg. Must be egg cell or ovum. Um, right, then we've got mitochondria in the middle section. The mitochondria, if you remember from grade 11 and cellular respiration, they... Um, perform cellular respiration, which produces energy. So that's going to give energy to the sperm cells to swim. And the tail is used for swimming. So these two have a relationship with one another. This makes the energy, and the energy is used by the tail for swimming. Okay, so that's the males. Right, then the female. Is everyone okay? I know I'm going through things quite quickly, um, but I'm hoping everyone is still with me. Right. 
The female reproductive system is also a diagram you need to be able to label. This diagram that I've got on my screen here is a little, uh, has a few more labels than, than you really require. So I'm going to go through the ones that you need to know. So this here is the vagina. And the job of the vagina or the function of the vagina is to receive the penis during copulation, which is the biological term for sexual intercourse, and receives the semen. But then it has another function where the baby needs to come out during natural childbirth. So it receives the penis during copulation, but it also acts as a birth canal during birth. Right, then we've got the cervix. That's not something that's usually asked about in detail, um, but that's the little opening to the uterus. And then we've got the uterus, which is this muscular almost bag. Um, here, I want to point something out to you. This here is the uterine wall. So whenever you're answering a question about the endometrium, this is why you can't say uterine wall, because this is the wall. It's this whole muscle here. But we are almost always referring to this inner lining, which is the endometrium. That's the part that sheds during menstruation, but it's also the part that the egg um, the fertilized egg cell is going to um, implant into. All right, then we've got fallopian tubes, and at the end of the fallopian tube, we have the ovary, which we'll go through in more detail now. Right, this unfortunately is a very pixelated diagram. Um, for whatever reason, we couldn't get hold of a of a slightly nicer one. I've got one in color on the next slide, but I just want to go through the layers of an of an ovum that you need to know. So it's we're never going to ask you to draw this, right? But we will ask you to to label it. Sometimes it will be labeled in various stages of its development. Um, but if we start from the middle, we've got the nucleus. Remember, it's haploid. It's got 23 chromosomes. Then we've got cytoplasm and the cell membrane. And then technically, there's more than one layer here, right? Some textbooks will speak about all the different layers, but you really just need to know that the layer outside of the cell membrane is referred to as the jelly layer, right? And that is all you need to know about that that layer that surrounds and protects the developing um, ovum. Right, this one you can see a few more details. So after the cell membrane, you can see that there's this jelly layer with some cells, but like I said, you don't need to worry about that. But I just included this diagram because it's a little clearer. Right, so that's the female system and the male system. Um, I spent more time on the male system there because the female system is going to get some extra attention just now. Um, now, this word, gametogenesis, I know I'm going quickly and I hope you're all still with me, um, but I want to cover as much as I can. Gametogenesis is the general term for the creation of gametes. Okay, so gamete refers to the gametes. And the genesis refers to or means creation. So the creation of gametes. But that's in general for males and females collectively. Um, and the process that gametogenesis uses is meiosis. So all the details about meiosis would be asked in paper two. But you do need to know for paper one that it is meiosis that is happening during gametogenesis. Okay. Um, right. So in a male, that production of the sperm cells of those gametes is happening in the testes, like I showed you earlier. And its specific name is spermatogenesis because we're specifically making sperm cells. And in females, it's happening in the ovaries. And it's producing um, egg cells or ovum or ova, should I say, um, by oogenesis. Now, if they give you a diagram of this process and they don't tell you 
if it's a male or a female and they ask you the name of the process, then you just say gametogenesis. But if somewhere in the question they tell you it's in a male or they show you in the diagram four little sperm cells that are developing at the end and they ask you the name of the process, then you must be specific because then it's specifically in a male and you can see that or you're told that, then your answer must be spermatogenesis. Okay, so remember to be specific. Okay, now everybody take a deep breath, myself included. Okay, and if your brains weren't switched on before, now you need to switch them on. <laughs> um, but the menstrual cycle is one of the, the parts of the human reproduction system that learners tend to struggle with the most. Um, however, it's a very important part and they always ask it. So they'll ask it in different ways, but it's always, always asked. So you must know the four hormones involved in the menstrual cycle and what they do. Okay, so I'm going to go through this with you. This little abbreviation here is just for you to remember what the different hormones are. So the F stands for FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. L is for LH, luteinizing hormone. And then the O is for, ergen, uh, is for estrogen and the P is for progesterone. Okay, so in this little table, I've got a little summary of what the hormones are and what their main function is. Okay, and sometimes because the endocrine chapter is also in paper one, they will sometimes link these hormones, they'll link the endocrine system and, and um, the concept of homeostasis and negative feedback with the reproduction system chapter. Okay, because those hormones feature in both of those chapters. So you need to know how the hormones influence one another. There is a question that I'm going to go through with you on that just now. Right, this part here, where the hormone is created, right, or where the hormone is, is made, um, is important because it often comes up. Um, an easy way to remember it is FSH, LH. Both of these H's stand for hormone, but they can also stand for hypothesis. And another name for the pituitary gland is the hypothesis. Not the hypothesis from scientific method, but hypothesis. And those two hormones are made in the hypothesis. So they come from the brain. Okay. And these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, they come from the ovary. Okay, so FSH, its job is exactly what its name says, follicle stimulating. So it stimulates, which means it encourages the growth and the development of the follicle. The follicle is the little cell that is going to grow to be the ovum. So it starts getting it to grow bigger. Luteinizing hormone's job is to stimulate ovulation, okay? Stimulate, again, means to encourage the ovulation to happen. Okay, so I want to focus here quickly. Everyone pay attention on this word stimulate. When we're talking about hormones, hormones either cause or make something happen, or they prevent or slow down or stop something from happening. Okay, so you can't, if we ask you, what is the function of luteinizing hormone? You cannot just say ovulation, right? Its job is not ovulation. Is it to start ovulation? Is it to encourage ovulation? Or is it to slow down ovulation? Okay, so you must remember with hormones, it's always a kind of a level of more or less and its effect. So you have to say the word stimulates 
in an answer when you're giving the function of those hormones. Right, then estrogen. Estrogen's job is to thicken the lining of the of the the inner lining of the uterus, which is called the endometrium. So that's its job. It's to provide the nice, comfortable spot for the the embryo to eventually implant. Okay. And it's not on here, but it's coming on the next slide. Estrogen is created by the graphene follicle, which is in the ovary. And then once ovulation happens, then the progesterone is secreted from the corpus luteum. And its job is to continue. So the word maintain means to keep it the same, to continue thickening the endometrium. So the estrogen starts thickening the the endometrium and then the progesterone is going to maintain that it's going to continue the keeping the endometrium nice and thick right and then various things can happen if the person is pregnant or not if the person is not pregnant then progesterone levels will drop and then this thickness of the endometrium is not going to be maintained therefore it will shed and the person will have their period but if the person is pregnant then progesterone will continue to be uh, secreted and that is then going to maintain the pregnancy yeah just aware of time i want to try and get through the notes just so that we're all on the same page um and so you know where i'm kind of headed i want us to get through the notes um be by quarter past 11 so that we've got an hour for the questions Okay, we are nearly done. Right, this looks very daunting, right? I know it looks quite scary when you look at this for the first time, um, but it is something that is often asked, but they often don't ask the whole thing together. They'll ask sections. So they will give you just a piece of it. They'll give you a part of this diagram, or maybe they'll give you these two graphs or these two graphs. Okay, they don't give it to you all of it together. So it's important for you to understand what it is showing. Okay, so I'm going to go through it with you kind of step by step. Right, so with the menstrual cycle, there are essentially two phases, two things happening. At the same time, we've got the uterine cycle. That's what's happening in the uterus. So this here is representing the inner lining of the uterus, so the endometrial layer. Then you've got the ovarian cycle. That's what's happening in the ovary, right? And they're happening at the same time, right? So the uterine cycle is the lining of the endometrium. This is what's happening in the ovary. And this is the, or these are the hormones that are controlling what's happening here and here. All right. So let's go through it. I'm going to go through the ovarian cycle and then the uterine cycle, touching on the different hormones. But before I do that, this body temperature one you can ignore um, in terms of studying it, but I'll point something out at the end. This pituitary hormones, these are the ones produced by the brain. So you've got follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And then you've got your ovarian hormones. So these are your hormones coming from the ovary. You've got estrogen and you've got progesterone, right? And at the bottom, we've got these, the days, okay? So in general, a person's menstrual cycle is 28 days, right? It could be different, but in, that's in general. And therefore, in general, ovulation happens on day 14. But if they give you a diagram and their graph looks slightly different, around the hormones and they ask you when ovulation happens then you must take it from the graph they've given you because maybe it's not day 14 maybe it's day 13 okay so let's go through it right so in the ovary we've got these little follicles and the follicles are growing and they the follicle is getting bigger and bigger okay and as it gets bigger or what you'll notice is with this follicle getting bigger, this follicle stimulating hormone, the light blue line over here, is increasing. Okay, you'll notice it doesn't increase that much 
follicle stimulating hormone FSH, you need very little of it to make a big difference. But as this hormone goes up slightly, this follicle is getting bigger because the follicle stimulates the sorry, the follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicle to get bigger. And as this follicle is getting bigger, we notice something about another hormone. Estrogen is going up, right? So as this gets bigger, estrogen is going up. And that's because this follicle is making the estrogen. So as the follicle gets bigger and bigger, it makes more and more estrogen. And what is estrogen's job? Estrogen's job is to thicken the endometrium. So as estrogen gets higher, we see the lining of the uterus starting to get thicker. Okay, so the endometrium also gets thicker as estrogen gets more or gets higher. Right. Then this follicle over here, this largest follicle over here, is called the graphian follicle. Right, that's an important one to know. So you need to know that the biggest follicle is called the graphian follicle. And the graphian follicle is the one that is going to rupture and release the little ovum during ovulation. So the so ovulation itself is the process by which the graphian follicle ruptures to release the ovum. Okay, now the thing that causes this to happen is luteinizing hormone. So what you should notice is that luteinizing hormone, this dark blue line here, it's quite low most of the time. But then just before ovulation, it spikes and it gets to the highest it will be. And then it drops again straight afterwards and then it remains low. So one of the things you must remember about luteinizing hormone its job is to stimulate ovulation. So it's going to peak just, or it's going to start increasing just before, but it's going to peak at ovulation. So see here, it peaks, and just after that, the egg is released. Okay. So if they give you this a graph with just this little section, you must remember that the way you tell when ovulation happens is to look for when luteinizing hormone peaks okay right now if this follicle this graphene follicle is producing estrogen and now ovulation happens and that graphene follicle ruptures and it opens then the estrogen levels are going to drop do you see that that just after ovulation or when ovulation happens the estrogen levels fall because the graphene follicle is no longer producing estrogen. Okay, but now what we see is this hormone start increasing. It was low before, and now it starts to increase. And this hormone is progesterone, and it's increasing after ovulation because it is made by the corpus luteum. So this graphene follicle, after it releases the egg cell, it becomes the corpus luteum, which is then going to produce progesterone. And its job is to keep thickening this endometrium. So it keeps this endometrium nice and thick. Okay, now they can ask questions about um, pregnancy. And if you know if a woman is pregnant based on these kinds of diagrams. Okay, so what must you look for? If the woman is going to be pregnant, then this lining of the uterus has to stay thick, right? Otherwise, if it sheds, if it falls away, then the implanted embryo is going to fall away as well. So we would look for the endometrial layer staying thick. This person isn't pregnant because it's shedding. If this is thick, it means that progesterone is keeping it thick. So the progesterone level in a pregnant person would have to stay high but in this case it drops therefore not pregnant another thing we can look for is the corpus luteum the corpus luteum if the woman is pregnant it will stay large but if she's not pregnant it will start to disintegrate it will start to get smaller 
And as it gets smaller and smaller, it releases less and less progesterone. And that's what causes the progesterone drop and then the shedding of the endometrium. Okay, so um, these graphs and diagrams, they can come across as very complicated. But if you learn them kind of step by step and you know what's happening in the ovary and the uterus, and how the hormones influence it, then that will help. All right, I think this is the last one. Um, this is looking at an ovary as it goes through the ovarian cycle. Okay, so they don't really ask the different stages of development so long as you're able to identify that this is a follicle that's growing okay so just like we saw over there right we're looking at what's happening here but just on an ovary okay so here's the follicle growing there's the follicle growing right getting bigger and bigger as it gets bigger what hormone is making it get bigger Okay, think for yourself quickly. What hormone is stimulating this follicle to grow? Right? Hopefully you said FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And then the, the follicle itself is also producing a hormone. So as this one grows, it's producing estrogen. So estrogen is getting more and more and more. And then we have this. You need to know that this is the biggest follicle, which is called the graphene follicle. Okay. The graphene follicle, it's very big because it's filled with fluid, but you don't have to label this follicle other than knowing it's the graphene follicle. Okay. Right. And then we see this happening here. This represents ovulation. So the, the little ovum, right, is burst out of the graphene follicle. Now, what hormone causes that to happen? So that if they give you a diagram like this, they might ask you, what is this process called? Ovulation. What hormone is responsible for ovulation? It's luteinizing hormone or LH. Okay. This will then go into the fallopian tube and this, the graphene follicle, will become the corpus luteum and it now makes progesterone so progesterone levels are going to go up if this corpus luteum gets smaller then the amount of progesterone starts to get less or decreases and therefore the person is not pregnant fertilization did not occur okay this is just to show you that sometimes they will ask you here's the ovary okay Here's the follicle, right, that um, produced the egg. And here's a corpus luteum. They can ask you a few things in one diagram. So I'm going to just quickly point some things out to you. So they can ask you about the ovarian cycle, right? They can ask you about an ovum. This is the sperm cell entering the ovum. So this is about fertilization. They can ask you what process is happening here. They could ask you how the sperm cell is suited for fertilization. Then you would talk about the acrosome, for example, or how the tail helped it to swim there. Then they can ask you about the development of the zygote. So once the sperm cell fertilizes the egg cell, it's called a zygote, if you remember from what you've learned. And then it becomes a ball of cells. Once it's a ball of cells, we call it a marula. Don't worry about these in between names, but from a zygote, it becomes a marula, which is a ball of cells or a mass of cells. And then it becomes a blastocyst, which is when all the cells kind of gather on one side and we have a fluid filled space there. And it's the blastocyst that is going to implant into the endometrium. Okay, so now we've zoomed in. We've got the blastocyst that's implanted into the wall of the endometrium and we have a developing fetus. Now, the connection between the fetus and the wall of the uterus or the endometrium is the placenta. 
Okay. This over here is the umbilical cord. And I said to you that when I had a diagram, I was going to go through those three words with you. So I'll do that now. Um, so the umbilical cord is a cord of connective tissue that wraps around blood vessels. Okay, and we've got umbilical artery and umbilical veins. Now, in, in you, in an adult, if you remember back to grade 10, arteries, I always remember it, A for artery, A for away, A for away. So arteries move away from your heart and veins move towards your heart. So in the mother, the artery is moving away from the mom's body, going towards the baby. So what must go towards the baby? Nutrients, oxygen, all the good things must go from the mom to the baby. So the, the mother's artery is going to be carrying all of those things towards the baby. And the mother's vein is going to come towards the mother. So it's going to have all of the waste products and the carbon dioxide from the baby coming towards the mom. Because the mom's going to get rid of it for the baby. Okay, but in the baby, it's the other way around. Okay. The artery is still going away from the baby. A for away. So the umbilical artery moves away from the baby. But what is going away from the baby? Not oxygen. The baby doesn't want to send oxygen and nutrients away. So in the baby's umbilical artery is the waste products and the, the deoxygenated blood. That's why I've got it here in blue. But the umbilical vein is coming towards the baby. And that's going to have all the good stuff in it, the oxygen and the nutrients. Okay, so you it's a little bit confusing sometimes, but you have to remember the direction tells you what kind of blood vessel it is. It's still A for away. But what is in the blood is opposite to what it is for the mom. Okay, right. And if we zoom in over here, so here's the umbilical cord, and here we see the umbilical artery and the umbilical veins. They kind of wrap around one another. These little projections are called the chorionic villi. So on the outside, we've got, so in the developing embryo, um, we would have the amnion, and then the outer membrane is the chorion. And the chorion make these little extensions called chorionic villi. And they embed themselves into the endometrium. So when they ask you what makes the placenta, so this is the placenta, but what makes it is chorionic villi and endometrium. Okay, you can't just say one of them, it must be both. Okay, oh, don't want to go there yet. Right. Grade 12s, it's quarter past 11. Um, I know that was a lot, okay? I'm fully aware of the fact that that was a lot of information and a lot of me just talking. Um, so I would like you to take a few minutes to stand up, stretch your hands, stretch your legs, and at 20 past 11, I want to give you a little bit of time to look through some of these questions. Okay, so in your learner packs, let me just explain first and then I'm going to give you some time. We can't, I don't have the time to give you, to answer all of this on your own. I'm gonna come back to that at the end. Um, to answer all of this on your own and then for me to like mark it with you. But I would like you to, Go through as many of the multiple choice and the biological terms and the A, B, both, none, the column questions as you can. And then I'm going to go through the section B questions with you. Okay. Um, I will go through the answers with you, but I would like you to look through them and to just circle or put a little line next to the ones you think are the answers. 
Um, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you about five minutes. OK, I know that's not very long, but I want to get through as much as with you as I can. So see what you can do in five minutes just to kind of see where you're at and then we'll go through it. OK, so I'll check in with you again in five minutes. Um, Yana, in the meantime, if um, I'll just check the chat to see if there's anything there. And uh, nothing's come through yet. But maybe we can ask the teachers at the schools once their learners have answered some of these questions to post their answers in the chat for us. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. Thank you, teachers. If you can post some of your answers in the in the chat, then we can see how it's going. Okay, right, let's start going through these. Um, if I can just get an indication, 
um, if how did people find these questions? Did they find that it was fairly easy to answer or easier than before? Just looking to see how it's going in the chat. There's nothing in the chat yet, ma'am. So yet. maybe we can just see if one of the schools would be willing to post the answer to 111. What did they say was the answer to 111? Then hopefully we can see how it went. Colleagues? Let's see how it goes. I'm going to ask if you don't start posting, I'm going to start asking specific schools to answer. So let's <laughs> let's, let's have a school just answer that. Yeah, the first one, 1.1.1. 1. 1. 1. Just put in the letter that your school chose as the answer. I see Simunye has posted. Thank you so much, Simunye. Simunye says the answer is B, Mrs. Taylor. Thank you. And that is correct. The answer and is so B. And so does Jongu and Valhalla. Everyone's coming in and they're all saying B. So I think you did good in explaining. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Okay, right. So I'm going to go through Section A quite quickly. There's certain things I'm going to spend a little more time on, but I really want to get stuck into some of the things in, in Section B. Right, so as some of you already correctly identified, the structure where sperms are temporarily stored is the epididymis. Well done. Right, which one of the following is a function of the amniotic fluid? So that's the fluid that surrounds the baby. Okay, so now when you answer a question like this, you're going to read the question, which one, so I can only choose one, of the following is a function of the amniotic fluid. So now you're going to read through each of them because sometimes more than one sound correct, but one will be more correct than the others. So provides sorry, nutri but Sorry, yeah. ma'am, I'm just letting you know you've got lots of answers coming through. Your schools are very, they're hard, working very, very hard there. A lot of them are saying the answer is B. B, correct. Protects the fetus against mechanical injury. Good. So that is the correct answer. I just want to quickly highlight that quite a lot of learners often put things like provides nutrition or supplies oxygen to the fetus. So just remember that that doesn't come from the fluid around the baby. That's from the umbilical cord. Right, from the umbilical um, vein specifically. Right, the placenta is formed by the, I mentioned to you, there's two things that form the endometrium. So you should have your answer there as B, chorionic villi and endometrium. Right? And then number four, the advantage of the testes located in the scrotum outside of the body cavity. I think everyone know, or most people know this one. We went through it earlier. The answer there is also B, sperm development is more efficient at temperatures below 36. Okay. Um, right, then this one. Some learners struggle with this kind of question. I want to, it's a little bit inconvenient that it's split over two pages, but when they give you information in a table or sometimes they give you a list of things and then comes the question, some people sometimes get stuck. So the best way to approach it is to read this and figure out everything you can about it first before you even read the rest of the question. Okay, so it says, the table below shows the average testosterone levels in males of different age groups. So here we've got the different ages. We can see that the ages are getting older. And we've got the average testosterone level. So we also see here that the older the boy gets, the more testosterone he produces. Okay, now before I even look at the question, I can see that this Difference is not so big, right, 15 to 19, but there's a big jump here, less than 5 to 15. And that's from 0 to 10 years 
to 11 to 15 years. So somewhere between 10 and 15, something happens to make the testosterone much more. And if in your mind you're thinking, oh, that's when puberty happens, you're correct. So now let's see what the question is and what the options are. So the question itself is, which one of the following is an explanation, in other words, a reason for the difference in testosterone levels between the age groups? So why do we think there's a difference between these levels in these age groups? And when you read through the answers, two of them, we automatically are wrong from the beginning. Okay, because it says testosterone levels are higher in. Group one, then group three. Is that true? Is it higher in group one than group three? No. So that's automatically not an option for an answer. Here as well, group one more than group two? It's not. Group one is not more than group two. So that's also not an option for an answer. So I can only choose between B and C. So group two is, so testosterone levels are higher in group two than group one due to the start of puberty. So could that be a reason? Is it higher here than there due to puberty? Well, if I look at the ages, yes, that could be an option. Higher in group three than group one because it is needed to inhibit. Inhibit means to slow down or reduce the growth of long bones. Okay. Now, even if you don't remember what is core, what hormone causes the growth of bones? Does it make sense that from this age group to this age group, we would want the bones to grow less? No, because we're getting bigger. We're growing from 10 to 16. So that one is also not an option. So the option is B. Okay, so I wanted to go through that with you because even if you don't seem to understand this or you like, ah, oh, we didn't study age groups and testosterone levels. It's okay. They give you enough information to be able to work it out. Okay. Right. The following blood vessels lead to and from the placenta in a pregnant female. Okay. So these are the ones going to and from, but like between the mom and the baby the fetus. Now, this is a one that people often make mistakes with. So, remember arteries, umbilical, that's in the umbilical cord. So, umbilical arteries are going away from the baby. So, now, if I were you, okay, I'm just going to highlight this. If you have the opportunity, right, when you're doing an exam, right here, um, umbilical arteries, so they're going away from the baby. So what are they going to have? They're going to have oxygen and they're going to have nutrients. Oh, sorry, away from the baby is waste and CO2, right? So I'm not going to do it with all of them. I'm just showing you that on your exam, on your exam question paper, write in little notes so that it makes it easy for yourself. Okay, the umbilical vein that's coming towards the baby. So what's coming towards the baby? It's food and oxygen. Mother's artery, that's going away, A for away, from the mom. What's going away from the mom's heart? It's all the nutrients and all the oxygen going towards the baby. Okay, so make those little notes for yourself because then answering this is easy. Which one of the following sets of blood vessels transport blood with? high amounts of oxygen and nutrients. So which one's going to have high nutrients and oxygen? Umbilical vein, because it's coming towards the baby with the food and the nutrient and the oxygen, and the artery, so two and three. So your answer there is B. Okay, your answer there is B. I see there's a question, uh, something in the chat, but I'll get to it. Um, once I've gone through these. Uh, Mr. Taylor, it's just people answering the question. Oh, so someone, uh, it was perseverance who did say 116 should be B. Yay, good. Okay, 
Um, then 117, which one of the following is the correct sequence of events during human reproduction? Okay, so sometimes these can be confusing because they don't always include all the stages of human reproduction. Sometimes they leave them out, but you've got to just put them in the right order. Okay, so oogenesis, that is the making of the gamete. So could you have the making of the gamete, then the gamete is ovulated or released from the ovary, then fertilized, and then implanted? That one could make sense, right? That one seems, seems plausible. And I say that because, remember I said sometimes there's a few and, and some of more of them sound correct. So eugenesis, ovulation implantate no it wouldn't implant before it gets fertilized so that's not correct ovulation eugenesis no you wouldn't have an egg ovulated before it's even made so that one's not correct and therefore that one's not correct either so 117 is a okay now 118 and 119 here's a little scenario okay so let's go through it an investigation was carried out to determine the fertility levels of healthy males in different age groups. Okay, fertility levels refer to how, if, if we speak about how fertile someone is, we are speaking about how possible it is for them to have offspring, so for them to reproduce. And there's various things that can affect it. So, just for a bit of background information, in males, it could be how fast their sperm cells are, how healthy they are, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's see what they say here. So the procedure followed was as follows. 50 healthy males in each of the following age groups were asked to participate. Okay, now I know the topic of this lesson today is not scientific method but this is a scientific method question so I want to quickly remind you that there are certain things about the scientific method that you need to make sure that you know so I know I'm going off topic here a little bit but just quickly remember you need to know how to identify variables so the independent and dependent variable and fixed variables and validity reliability and accuracy how do we make those things, how do we make an experiment valid, reliable, and accurate? Um, don't really have time to go into that in massive detail today. I'll obviously answer this question, but if you can ask your teachers or if your teachers um, want a more detailed dis uh, explanation, they can also contact um, the subject advisor or myself and we, we can give you more information on that. Okay, right, so... 50 healthy males tells me if they're doing it with 50 people, 50 men, 50 is quite a high sample size. So that's a fair amount of reliability there. And they're doing it with males. So that's all a fixed variable in different age groups. So this is something we're changing. We're changing the different age groups. Okay. Semen was collected from each of the males. The number of active sperm cells present in the semen was counted for each man in each age group and averages were calculated. So for each man, right, we had 50 in this age group, 50 in this age group, so 50 per age group. They collected the semen and they counted how many active sperm cells there were in their sample. And then they worked out an average. Active would mean that they're swimming well, okay? Because if they're swimming well, that means that they are fertile. Right, so which one of the following is the dependent variable? Okay, the dependent variable is the thing you are measuring. And we are measuring here the number of active sperm cells. Right, that's physically what we're measuring. But your variable links to your aim. And here at the top, they gave us the aim of the investigation. An investigation was carried out to determine the Fertility levels in men of different age groups. This is the thing I'm measuring. I'm measuring the fertility level. But how did I measure the fertility level? I measured it by counting active sperm cells. Okay. So I measured it 
by looking at that. Now, which one is the dependent variable? It's fertility levels because my variable I must get from my aim. What is my experiment about? It's fertility levels in males of different age groups. I counted or I assessed my fertility levels by looking at this. This is what we call an indicator of a variable. Okay, they don't ask about the indicators really, but this is my indicator of my dependent variable. My dependent variable is fertility levels, okay? I'm saying it more than once because it's a common error that is made. Okay, so in this case though, they don't give fertility as, a, as an option, right? They only are giving this, so we must choose from what the options are. So we would say number of active sperm cells. But I can tell you that in a section B question, if they gave you this and they asked you, so there was no multiple choice, they asked you, identify the dependent variable. It is fertility level. Okay. Right, which one of the following variables was kept constant during this investigation? In other words, what did we keep the same? So the number of participants in each group or the fertility levels? No, we didn't keep that the same. The number of active sperm cells? No, we didn't keep that the same that we were counting. Age groups of the men? No, we didn't keep the age groups the same because we had different age groups. So the answer there is A, number of participants in each group. Okay, right, let's go through these biological terms. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly, okay, because I want to get to section B. Part of the female reproductive system where fertilization occurs, right, fertilization, that's where the sperm cell meets the egg cell, that happens in the fallopian tube. Okay, fallopian tube. The organelles found in large quantities in the neck region of a sperm cell. So those organelles that make energy, they are called the mitochondria. A hollow ball of cells that forms um, during embryonic development. That hollow ball of cells is, remember I said to you, there's like cells on the one side and then there's a fluid filled space. That's the blastocyst. Number four. The release of um, <clears throat> an ovum from the ovary is called ovulation. The structure in the sperm that contains enzymes to dissolve the outer layer of the ovum, that's your acrosome. A solid ball of cells formed from the zygote. So zygote, what's the next step? It's the marula. Number seven, the finger-like projections that develop from the outer extra embryonic membrane. They're not giving the extra embryonic membrane's name because it, otherwise it would give the answer away. But that outer, the finger-like projections is what they're asking for. Okay, the outer extra emb embryonic membrane is the chorion, but that's not what they've asked. They've asked for the projections that develop from that. So it's chorionic villi and they would want or villi they would want the whole thing okay you would need to have both words in that answer um the tube in the male reproductive system that connects the epididymis with the urethra that's the vas deferens and the meiotic process by which female gametes are formed that is oogenesis okay right 1.3, I'm going to go through the answers here quickly, but I want to quickly just remind you with regards to how you answer these, you can either write A, just the letter, or you can write A only, so you can write the word only, or you can write B or B only. If you think none of them are the correct answer, then you just write the word none. If you think it's both, then either you write the word both, so literally just the word both is fine, we accept that, or you write both A and B, or you can write A plus B, but do not do this. Okay, so I'm just, I'm showing you now what you mustn't do. So let me put it in red. No, red's not an option. <laughs> 
Don't do this. If you're trying to say that the answer is both, don't do that. Because that looks like A or B. Then it's going to look like you don't know which one is correct. Okay, then it's going to be wrong. Right, let's go through the answers. Secretions, that means something that is released from this gland, contribute to the formation of semen. Okay, so the semen is the fluid. Cowper's gland releases um, fluid or secretion. So A is correct and prostate is correct. So both A and B. A structure that transports semen out of the body, not the scrotum, urethra, yes. So B only. Ejaculated, which means released from the male during copulation. Copulation is the biological term for sex or sexual intercourse. Um, semen is ejaculated, yes. Amniotic fluid, no. So the answer is A only. Hormones secreted by the pituitary gland or hypophysis, right? It's the same part. It's just got two names. Estrogen, no. Estrogen comes from the ovary. FSH, yes. So B only there. These are for two marks each. So learners sometimes rush these, but think about them carefully because they are worth two marks each. Okay. Right. Section B. Um, I'm going to go back to my slideshow because I've got the slide with the answers next to it and then everything is kind of just together then you can see the answers instead of me just kind of reading the answers to you right so we only have half an hour left um it's amazing how quickly the time goes i want to cover as much of this as i can okay if there is something i just want to say it now if there is something that i don't get to all right i will um I will ask Jana if it's possible that we can send the slideshow to all the different schools' teachers so they can go through the answers with you in class. I don't want you guys to not go through all of them, but I want to cover as much as we can together. Okay. Right. Um, the diagram below represents the female reproductive system. Okay, so they're telling us exactly what we're looking at. Now, grade 12s, my tip to you is. Before you even read these questions, always look at your diagram first. Try and make sense of your diagram. Label it if you can. Figure out what it's trying to show you or tell you. And then answer, look at the questions. Okay. Understand what you're looking at first. Okay. So um, labeling, let's go through the labels quickly. You can just write them in because you've got all of this in your book. Little booklet. A is the fallopian tube. Okay, B is pointing to this inner lining over here. So it's the endometrium. C is pointing to this tube over here, which is the vagina. And D, D is pointing to two different places. Okay, if D was only pointing to the space in the middle or only pointing to this over here, it's saying that they could be labeled the same thing. Right, so what got both of those things referring to? It's referring to the uterus. Right. Um, let's go through the questions. Right, identify part B. Oh, we've already done that. So you would, if the question says identify, we only want you to write down the name. And preferably not. Uterine. Takes part at A that leads to zygote formation. Right. So what happens here that creates a zygote? That process, they want the name of the process. It is fertilization. Okay. Remember to read the question carefully so at the very beginning of today I said to you that often we have learners who they just look at a part of the question and they make up what they think the question's asking so they could look at this and they go oh a and they write fallopian tube because they think the question has asked 
to give the name of A, but read the question carefully. They want to know what process happens there. Right, describe the process in 2.1.2. So now what they want is for you to describe fertilization. So grade 12s, it does mean that if you got this one wrong, then you're going to also not be able to answer this one potentially. Okay. Right. But please note that this describe, describe means to um, like tell the story of how something happens. But it's only for one mark. So this is not a long description. Okay. So for fertilization, don't worry about writing in the answers. They're going to come up um, now now. But the nucleus of the sperm cell fuses with the nucleus of the ovum. Okay. Um, I want to quickly go through these questions and then I'm going to put the rest of the answers all up together. Describe the development of the zygote until implantation occurs. Okay. So this is four marks. Here you're describing, so they're telling you of the zygote. So your starting point is zygote. So you're not going to tell me how a zygote's made. You're not going to re-explain fertilization, right? Your starting point is a zygote. So that's after fertilization has occurred. And you're going to have to tell me what happens from zygote all the way into where it lands here and implants, okay? Then describe two ways in which part D is structurally suited for gestation. I'll pull up the answer for that other one now. Um, now, explain. Whenever you see explain, think you must say what something is, but also the reason. So it's always like a how and why. Okay, like a cause and effect. So that's why it's for four marks. Because for part D, you're going to give me a structural means physical. So how is it physically suited? You're going to tell me what its physical adaptation is and then how it helps for gestation. So gestation means development of the fetus. Okay. And then this last one, describe how the secretion of the prostate gland provides protection of the sperm from conditions in part C. That one is all about the conditions in part C. The vagina is acidic. So this is all about the alkalinity. So I'm pulling up the memo here. Um, like I said, I'll see if we can send this to the school. So I know you won't necessarily have time to or the recording at least um time to to write all of this down um but for the zygote one notice that so from the time the zygotes formed they want you to say that the zygote is going to divide by mitosis so it's going to one cell becomes two two becomes four so it starts growing and developing until it makes a solid ball of cells called the marula Okay, some people would say the zygote divides by mitosis to form the marula, which is a solid ball of cells. Okay, try and describe as much as you can. Then that develops into the blastocyst, which is a hollow ball of cells. Okay. Um, some learners might then go on to explaining implantation because the question said until implantation occurs, but we would then just stop marking here. Okay, so potentially you'd still get the marks that you need. Right, then number five was explain two ways in which part D is structurally suited. So here you can see, see how they The context is explain how it's suited for gestation. So it's muscular to protect the fetus from mechanical injury. Or you could say it's muscular to allow the for the birthing process. This is all about the contractions that the uterus will undergo. Another thing you could have said is it's flexible. So it can stretch and contract and relax. 
to accommodate the growing fetus. So it can stretch or it's flexible to allow the fetus to grow. Whoopsie. Sorry. It's hollow to accommodate the growing fetus. Any two of those. Okay. So either that one, that one, or that one. But remember, it's got two marks per thing. The structure and what makes that useful for the developing baby. Right, then the last question, 2.6, was about the prostate gland providing protection. Remember I said at the beginning, you don't actually have to know which glands release which fluid. So they've specifically mentioned prostate gland, but you don't have to have learned that. Remember I said it's more important for you to learn what are the different fluids, um, like what are their functions. So the protective function, and they tell you in the question from the conditions of part C, is it's alkaline to neutralize the acidic conditions in the vagina. Okay, that neutralized word there is important. Okay. Right, here we have a little extract. So you've got this in front of you as well. Um, let's quickly go through it. This, they ask you some things that are um, not related to the content that you've studied. And the reason why we put a question like this in here is to show you that with your knowledge of the female system and the things you have had to learn, you can be asked other questions, right? You can be asked, um, extension questions right so i'm going to forgive me but i'm going to read through this quite quickly um uh, due to time so an ectopic pregnancy is a problem in which the embryo attaches to the outside of the uterus so it attaches outside the uterus right in most cases the embryo implants in the fallopian tube so outside of the uterus but in here this is what it's telling you. And we see that in the picture. There's the fetus developing in the fallopian tube. Um, but it could also occur, occur in the ovary or in the cervix or outside of the uterus in the abdominal cavity. An ectopic pregnancy cannot proceed normally. The embryo usually cannot survive. Okay, because those parts of the body are not suited for the growth of a fetus. Right, ectopic pregnancies are caused by one or more of the following. So these are the things that can cause it. An infection or inflammation in the fallopian tube. The development of scar tissue from a previous infection or a surgical procedure. So if you had had a surgical procedure on a fallopian tube, it can lead to scar tissue, which basically means like thick tissue. And then the, the little egg wouldn't be able to get all the way through properly and it possibly implants there. Previous surgery in the pelvic area. Right, in most cases, the fallopian tube where the ectopic pregnancy occurs has to be removed surgically to save the woman's life because if it grew here, it would rupture and the woman would suffer with internal bleeding. Okay, so what are the questions? Give only the letters, okay, grade 12s. If they ask, give only the letters and you give the name. Even if those names are correct, we can't mark it right. Okay, so if they ask letters, you must only give letters. Of two parts in the diagram where implantation of the embryo may occur during an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so they have told us in a description where it could happen. Ovaries, cervix, abdominal cavity. But now they want two letters from here. Okay, so did they speak about A? No, not really. They didn't speak about the end of the fallopian tube. Um, but technically, that's the fallopian tube. So, yes. B, they spoke about fallopian tube. So, yes. C, that's where it's meant to implant, but that's not where an ectopic one is implanting. They spoke about cervix. So, this is the cervix. Yes. Did they mention vagina? No, so you can't say that. So your answers are A, B, or E. And they, the question said, give two. So you only give two, and we will mark the two that you write. Right, explain why women who have had surgery on their fallopian tubes have a greater risk of experiencing an ectopic pregnancy. So I just want to show you here the memo. 
they link look here quickly they tell you scar tissue from previous infection or surgical procedure and the question is why would a surgical procedure lead to an ectopic pregnancy and they tell you in here it's because of scar tissue but you can't just rewrite what the information is you need to answer the question so the scar tissue because of that surgery may block the fallopian tube so the embryo can't get to the uterus right so look here if you had surgery and there was scar tissue here then it might be the space might be small enough for a sperm cell to get through so you end up having this embryo developing but the embryo can't get through the scar tissue okay these questions are quite difficult because they're not directly what you've studied but you have to use the knowledge you have from what you've studied to answer the question explain why a woman who had her fallopian tube removed after an ectopic pregnancy may still be able to fall pregnant, okay? Because if she had this removed, she can still fall pregnant because she's got another fallopian tube. It reduces her chances, but she can still have children via this ovary and that fallopian tube, okay? So the answer there is the other fallopian tube is still present. And fertilization may still take place in that fallopian tube. You can see here there's different options for the answer. Okay, so you might have said that as an answer. Or you could say, if you know about in vitro fertilization, then you could say that she could fall pregnant via in vitro fertilization, right? That's when an embryo gets inserted into the uterus. It's not from the egg from your fallopian tube. Or it doesn't travel that pathway. Um, the ovum can be placed um, after the blockage, allowing fertilization to take place. So those are all with kind of medical assistance. Right, and then give two reasons why the embryo may not be able to survive during an ectopic pregnancy. That's because of a lack of space. So you don't have to use the word insufficient. That just means not enough. So there's not enough space. And if there's not enough space, then you're not going to have enough space for the placenta to grow. The baby's not going to have enough nutrients or oxygen or low blood supply. Any two of those. Okay. So that's a very much an application question. Right, I want to go through this one here because this is an important one. And this is our last question before I want to just go through one or two other things. Um, I want you to just also realize we haven't asked every single thing. We haven't given you questions on every single thing, but we tried, we've tried to cover some of the more challenging things or to expose you to different kinds of questions. Okay. That learners often struggle with. Right. So we have a question that says the graph below shows the levels of two hormones that are secreted by the pituitary gland during the menstrual cycle. Right, now we have this graph, and if you studied really well, then you will recognize that this looks a little bit like that graph from the big picture I showed you. Okay, so we've got hormone levels, we've got time, and they just say hormone A and B. Now, I don't know which ones they are yet. I'm pretending I'm a student. You don't know which ones they are yet. Okay, does, does my question give me any clues? Right, it says, the graph shows the levels of two hormones that are secreted by the pituitary gland. Right, the pituitary gland is in the brain. What's the other name for a pituitary gland? The hypothesis. H for hypothesis. H for the H in FSH and LH. Okay, that's my little tip to remember it. So these two hormones came from the pituitary gland. They can only be FSH and LH. It can't be estrogen and progesterone, right? And if I know my diagrams or my graphs, well, I know that the one that peaks higher is luteinizing hormone. So before I even go through my questions, I can figure out that this one is FSH. 
And the dotted line one is LH, luteinizing hormone. Okay. And I know that because I know which two hormones it must be. And I've learned which one belongs with which shape. Okay. Right. So stage two functions of hormone B. Now, they haven't asked you. Remember I said some learners just look at the question quickly and then they don't actually answer the question. They haven't asked you what is hormone B. They don't want luteinizing hormone as the answer. They want the functions. What does luteinizing hormone do? Okay, this one peaks at ovulation. So what about ovulation? You can't just say ovulation. Okay, you need to say what it does about ovulation. It stimulates ovulation. Okay. So stimulates ovulation. Then that's the one that's in the table that we went through with you. But they want two functions. Okay. Now this second one requires a bit of thinking. If this stimulates ovulation and ovulation then happens, right? What happens to the graphene follicle? That big follicle that released the ovum. It becomes the corpus luteum. So indirectly. This is going to stimulate ovulation and stimulate the development of the corpus luteum. Okay, because it's causing the graphene follicle to rupture, it's then the thing that triggers the graphene follicle becoming the corpus luteum. But again, I'll quickly put the memo up here for you. You've got to say stimulates the development. Or you can say... Um, causes the graphene follicle to become the corpus luteum. So you can word it like that, but you can't just say corpus luteum. Okay. Another thing, don't say creates corpus luteum. The hormone doesn't create the corpus luteum. It causes, it's responsible for the graphene follicle becoming the corpus luteum. So just be careful with your wording there. Right. Explain why a female who is struggling to get pregnant may be given pills containing hormone A as a treatment. Okay. Hormone A is follicle stimulating hormone. Now, you have to think, how would that help a woman get pregnant? If she is given more FSH, so pills with FSH, if she's given more FSH, how does that help her get pregnant? Well, more FSH means more follicles. If there's more follicles, there's a higher chance of her getting pregnant because she's going to have more ovum, more ova. Okay, so that's the answer there. FSH is going to stimulate the follicles to develop. Therefore, there will be more over, to, more over. Right, so that's increasing her chances of getting pregnant. Right, why will a female who is struggling to get pregnant have her levels of hormone B monitored? Monitored means checked. So why would we want to check this? So a woman is struggling to fall pregnant. Now we must keep checking luteinizing hormone. Okay. Luteinizing hormone causes ovulation. So if she's struggling to get pregnant and we monitor that, then we can see when we have the peak in hormone B. We can see when we have an increase in luteinizing hormone. Therefore, we can see when ovulation is going to happen so that we can have try and time the sexual intercourse to be at the time when the egg is going to be released, the egg cells released. Okay, I want to quickly point something out. These questions were explain. So you can't just write one sentence, okay? You have to say, for example, the um, peak in, in hormone B or the peak in luteinizing hormone. What about it? Explain it. It will show us when ovulation is going to happen. Okay, you need to write more. Explain the reason. Okay, explain how the hormone or how the levels in hormone A on days 0 to 5 will differ in a pregnant female. Okay, so these, this beginning part, 
Okay, hormone A is follicle stimulating hormone. If the woman is pregnant, is there a need for her to release more FSH for more follicles to be, be developed? No, she's not going to ovulate when she's pregnant. She's already pregnant. High pregnancy, oh, sorry, pregnancy means high progesterone, and progesterone inhibits FSH. Okay, so these hormone levels are going to be lower. They're not going to like not exist, but they're going to be lower. But they want you to explain. So how the hormone levels will differ. First of all, how they will differ is they're going to be lower. But you can't stop there. You have to explain why they're going to be lower. Okay. So the levels will be low. Because high progesterone levels during pregnancy inhibit FSH. Inhibit means reduce or slow down. Okay. Explain the negative feedback mechanism that occurs between progesterone and FSH. This links to the endocrine chapter. So there's a few ways in which you can answer this. But like we've just said here, FSH is inhibited by progesterone. So the negative feedback they want is for you to say that when the progesterone levels are high, so imagine now the woman is pregnant, the progesterone levels are high, a message is going to be sent to the pituitary gland in the brain to secrete less FSH, right? So that a new follicle does not develop. Another way of you... um saying it is the other way around okay remember they didn't ask this in relation to the pregnant female they just ask negative feedback negative feedback is when um there's a change that happens and often with the use of a hormone some kind of like balance is restored okay so that you didn't have to answer it like this because it doesn't link to this question. So you could have also answered it this way around, which is why they have the option on the memo. So low levels of progesterone, so when progesterone is low, FSH is not inhibited. So therefore, the pituitary gland is stimulated to secrete more FSH to stimulate the development of new follicles. Okay. That negative feedback is quite a useful and important one. Okay, now grade 12s, we have five minutes left. So ideally, ideally, what I would have wanted you to do is to do this little pre-test. I would have wanted you to do it again and to see if you now, things you got wrong before, you now get correct, all right? However, I want to show you something else instead. So by all means, please, if you have the time or when you get home later, please do the little test again and see if you now get the answers correct. But I would like to draw your attention to something at the very beginning of your um, of those packs that you have. So turn to the very front for me. Um, I'm sure that in most cases your teachers would have um, shown you these exam guidelines or you have a copy of them already, but I just want to point something out to you, okay? For every chapter in both paper one and paper two, there are these exam guidelines. And these exam guidelines tell you exactly what it is you need to know for that section. So when you study, you need to use these exam guidelines almost as like a checkbox, right? I tell my students that if you know this, tick it off and use a different color. If for prelims, you tick it in blue. And then for finals, you tick it again. Every time you study it, you tick it off that you know it, okay? But it gives you, when the people who set your exam, set your exam, they have to set it according to this. Now, can they ask ex um, extension questions like their topic one? Yes, because it links to the physical parts of the female reproductive system. So they're going to ask application questions as well, but it gives you a starting point, 
okay? And if you can do everything that they tell you you have to be able to do in here, then you will pass your exam. So, for example, you must know the structure of the mail system using a diagram, so be able to label it. And know the functions of these parts. Know the female system and the functions of the ovary. So, like I said, have a diagram, label it. Then next to each label, write the functions. If you can do that, then you've already been, you can already tick those off. Okay? Then the structure of an ovary. So using a diagram, looking at a diagram, you must know the structure of an ovary. You must be able to label the follicles, label the graphene follicle and the corpus luteum. Okay, I want to skip to this part over here. Right, here they say you must know the formation of gametes or gametogenesis is by meiosis. So the process is meiosis. Okay, in a male it's spermatogenesis, in a female it's Eugenesis. And then look here, they actually give you a description. Now this one, spermatogenesis and this description, and eugenesis and this description, that is basically what ends up on a memo in a final exam. If they ask you, describe the process of spermatogenesis, you just write this. This is the process. So I want you to point this out because in some places they just tell you know the functions, but they don't actually tell you here what the functions are. That's in your notes. But there are places where they actually give you the notes in the exam guidelines. Okay, so this is the process of spermatogenesis. Then you must know a sperm using a diagram and the functions of the parts of the sperm. Okay, these are the notes. And then you must know the structure and function of the parts of the ovum. Okay. Again, here, they go through. You must know what's happening in the ovarian cycle. So can you explain the development of the graphene follicle and what causes it? Can you describe ovulation and what causes it? Okay. So use your exam guidelines to your advantage. Right. So that you cover yourself and you make sure you know exactly all the things that you need to know. All right, grade 12, thank you very much for having me.